Hi, this is Steve Haynes from Haynes Fire and Risk Consulting. I'll be presenting Rural Water Supply in the 21st Century, Part 5. Uh, we've broken Part 5 into two pieces, 5A and 5B, because it was just a little too long for uh, YouTube to handle. I uh, hope you enjoy the uh, presentation. In Part 5, we're going to get away from the administrative functions that we talked about in Parts 1 through 4, and we're going to move into tactics, strategies, and equipment. Uh, we're going to focus on concentrating water up front in Part 5. The most important part of this is you have to have this into your SOPs and your mutual aid partners' SOPs. And the SOPs have to be based on minimal manning levels. Uh, there's so many departments out there that will tell you, oh yeah, we have SOPs, and when you really talk to their members about how often they use them, that you find out that they're, they're not used because the SOPs are built around optimal manning and they never have their optimal manning. So your SOPs need to be built around the idea that barely anybody shows up to a call so that those couple people can function. Then anybody else that shows up on top of that, when we're modifying our SOP on the fly, we're actually building upon it instead of tearing it apart. The second most important part of concentrating water up front is your running order for your apparatus. That's your apparatus and your mutual aid partner's apparatus. If you've missed sections three and four, or parts three and four, you should try to go back, take a look at them, and, and you'll see how important the running order of your apparatus is. So now we're gonna start our discussion on the SOPs surrounding the, con the concept of concentrating water up front. Uh, it's going to start with the first arriving engine. The first arriving engine is expected to take the front of the building, establish command, and initiate rescue or fire attack depending on the situation that they have. The most important part about this engine is it's not supposed to lay in, uh, particularly for a rear lot driveway with only one lane of access. And We'll show that to you in the next picture or next slide. So in the picture shown here, our first arriving engines taking the front of the building it's established command that it's initiating an attack. In this case here, it looks like they're starting with a transitional attack. The most important part about this is, is let's look at this driveway. It's just wide enough for an engine to fit up. This is very common in the Northeast and New England. And, and we've not laid a line yet because if we do lay, if this engine lays a line, everybody behind him has to run that line over and possibly get stuck behind it. So we want to make sure that driveway stays clear. One of the things we want to keep track of as we go through this presentation is the amount of gallons of water we deliver per driver. So the gallon per driver ratio, in this case here we have a thousand gallons with one driver, so we've got a ratio of 1,000. While we're talking tactics and strategies, I, I think it's important that folks out there understand, read, and follow up on some of the things that are developing out there. If such things as the UL, NIST, Governor Island tests, transitional attack, SLICE RS, VEIS, 3D firefighting. If these terms are foreign to you, you really ought to start researching them. There's a lot of science out there now. A lot of folks doing some really good research based around our tactics and strategies. It'll help you make your firefighting more effective. And it's not only going to help you to control the fire more effectively and search it, but it's going to make things safer for you and for the folks that are trapped in the building. Uh, so in the next slide here, I'm going to show you some uh, sources where you can get some more information on these because I think understanding some of this stuff is critical to rural firefighters. We have a tendency to think this stuff is only for city guys. This stuff is really important for a rural firefighter because no matter what we do, we're always going to be operating on limited water supplies or very thin water supplies compared to our city brethren. We need to understand how to apply water more efficiently. There's multiple sources out there, books, magazine articles that you can take a look at. What I've done here is I've just listed a couple of uh, websites that I found in my research. Um, it could help you at least get started in understanding some of this work that's going on. And I think that the most important part here is when I came into the service in 1983, you know, everything was really based on rules of thumb and what people thought was going in the building. There wasn't anyone out there really doing a lot of testing and taking measurements of what, what the building and how the environment in the building was reacting to what we were doing. I think a lot of this work is really going a long way in proving what works and what doesn't work. And I think it's going to make a, a big difference in improving the odds of survival, both for the trapped civilians and for our firefighters. A couple slides back, we showed the first arriving engine going into service in a transitional attack. I think this is a very viable tactic for the rural environment. The, uh, there's a couple things we need to keep in mind if we're going to go this route. First, we need to make sure that the water is properly applied. And the biggest thing is we want to darken that fire and then transition to an interior attack as quickly as possible. So we have to be cognizant of that line has to get shut down as soon as we darken the fire. We don't want it to sit there and try and drown the fire and run all our water out. The other thing is too is we need to make sure we pick a line that's got enough 
power to it to knock that fire down, to curl it or darken it down. So make sure you pick the right size line based on how many square feet or what proportion of the building you believe to be involved. The other part too is, is we need to deal with fires, large heavily involved fires. We need to start at the lowest, most heavily involved spaces first and then work our way out. If we're trying to deal with a fire on the second floor that's being fed by a fully involved first floor, we're just wasting our water if we dump it into the first floor, uh, I'm sorry, we're just wasting our water if we dump it into the second floor windows. Because we're not only fighting that fire on the second floor, we're fighting all the convective, radiant, and conducted heat that's coming up from the first floor. We need to knock the first floor out, then the second floor. And when we're talking about the transitional attack, there's really two ways to start this off. We, we can either start the attack off with equipment that's fixed to the truck or with portable equipment. When I first came into the service, we referred to this as a blitz attack where the engine pulled up, went into service with its deck gun. Uh, the problem with this approach is it's only effective if you've got very large openings into the building and the, and the streams are immediately shut down when the fire is darkened. Uh, more often than not, though, they end up being big waste of water because a lot of the, the truck can't get very close to the building, so a lot of the water is lost to wind or hitting the sides of the building, the roof of the building, you know, because the pattern's breaking apart by the time it gets to the building. There's a tendency to shoot the tank or flow too long, hoping for complete extinguishment. So once the guy gets up there and he starts flowing, no one wants to shut it down. It's, it's kind of cool to watch, right? So we just keep doing it. The other thing, too, is often, more often than not, the gun's mounted too high to achieve a proper angle to get deep penetration into the building. So if you're going to use the traditional attack or the traditional blitz attack, first off, we got to keep in mind it's got to be a quick burst with deep penetration into the fire. As soon as we darken that fire, we need to shut that line down and immediately go offensive if we're going to make this work right. I put this slide together to better demonstrate why the blitz attack, more often than not, is not successful. At least a traditional blitz attack using a truck mounted monitor. Uh, as you can see here, a lot of times the monitor is at about the same level as the second floor windows or just slightly below. So it does get very good penetration, really good angle of application into the uh, second floor, particularly if the truck can get close enough that the stream pattern hasn't had an opportunity to open up yet. Uh, obviously, there's never been a winter putting water on the roof. If the roof is comp intact, you're not gonna get any water into the building. The problem you run into with these guns is on a first story or a, or a ranch or a single story home is we're really washing the floors in a lot of cases. We're not getting that water up and into the upper reaches of that building and deep into the building. So a lot of times the blitz attack just doesn't work out for us on a, on a first floor application. The other problem we might run into too is if our stream starts to widen out, uh, there's a tendency for the fellow on the gun to say, well, if I can put a little water in this spot, I could hit a whole portion of the building if I open it up to a fog pattern. Well, the problem is, is even in a partial fog pattern, let's look at how much water is hitting the surfaces of the building and never penetrating the building. We've got this small stream area, so instead of having this nice, deep, uh, solid amount of water coming into the building and penetrating into that space, now we've got a broken pattern that's coming up. Most of the water, the gallon per minute, comes from that nozzle is being wasted on the outside of the building. The other thing that's true about this, too, this case and this case, particularly this case here, if our stream is starting to break up by the time it gets to that window, it's going to actually start entraining quite a bit of air with it. If it's not going in as a straight stream or a solid stream and it's starting to break up, you're going to start entraining air and, and you're going to create a high pressure zone in this area of the house and you are going to push fire. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people out there saying we don't really push fire. In this case here, if you put that stream pattern and it's just barely enough to fill that window, you're going to maximize airflow. Uh, and even whether you're doing that intentionally or accidentally. So it's just something to keep in mind. That the other choice for mounting a a transitional attack or even a defensive fire operation is the hand portable monitors. This equipment's come a really long way in the last 10 years. In this case here, I'm showing the TFT Blitz Fire and Acura Mercury. Uh, there's other brands out there. I'm showing these because I can show them without getting into copyright issues because we are an industrial vet, uh, rep for these companies. Uh, but the most important features of what make these really stand out, first off, they're lightweight. They've got a shutoff valve so that the firefighter at the nozzle can control it. They can flow up to about 500 gallon a minute, which is a lot of knockdown power. I think if you go back a couple slides ago, that's about 800 square feet of knockdown power. And you're only dealing with a two and a half or three inch hose line. So one or two firefighters can rapidly move one of these from one window to another to another as they progress around the building while they're knocking, darkening things down and trying to get ready for the transition into an interior attack.
In this slide here, we have a picture of a firefighter applying a portable master stream device into the uh, upper window of a Cape Cod home. The, uh, as you can see, we've got a solid bore nozzle, and this line's coming right in. It's right at the perfect entry angle. We're getting nice, deep penetration, almost full gallonage of that monitor or nozzle is going right into that window. I would, I would expect that pretty soon afterwards, we're starting to see a lot of steam conversion showing up in this smoke column. Uh, even so, we got to keep in mind that there, there's a couple secrets to success of using these hand portable monitors. Uh, first, I think you really need to work with a straighter or solid stream to get deep penetration into that building. You want to be cognizant of how the stream's entering the building. Get as close in as you can to get as deep in as you can and keep that stream narrow so you don't push far. We don't want that stream opening up and actually starting to train a lot of air. The other part, too, is it's got to stay offensive the line. Darken the fire, shut down, move darken the fire, shut down, move. We got to avoid that tendency where people kind of get complacent and they're having so much fun shooting a large stream that they forget that the job is knock the fire down and then move. In this slide here, demonstrating a couple different approaches to uh, using a hand portable monitor. Uh, one of the things we talked about earlier, even though we're using a hand portable monitor, I've got the bulk of my first floor is on fire. It's spreading into the second. It's a pretty poor choice to put this monitor into service first on the second floor. Because as I mentioned earlier, you know, we're not only fighting the fire on this floor, we're fighting all the convective heat, radiant heat, and conducted heat that's coming up into that second floor that's going to have a tendency to boil off our water. When this water turns to steam, it's going right out through the, the vents, the openings. If I come down here and I move that stream and I, and I go after this first floor fire, first off, I'm knocking all this BTUs out. I'm actually fighting the fire that's creating the heat. All the heat from this fire is venting, going out up to the atmosphere. When I start doing, getting a lot of steam conversion down here, I'm not only helping this area of the building, that steam is actually going up into the fire column, it, following the rest of the, the air pattern through the building, and it's going to help to start darken the rest of that building down. So it's really important that we work from the heaviest, lowest fire, body of fire and move our way up so that we're, we're always working and gaining on the, on the heat output of that fire. Uh, once again, you know, the biggest thing here is we need to make sure that folks aren't going in there with a fog pattern and trying to, well, if I open this fog pattern up, I could probably hit that little bit of fire off to the side. Because all you're going to do here, once you get into this kind of pattern, you're increasing the amount of air you're in training, you're going to pressurize this first floor, and you're going to be pushing fire, you, no, no doubt about it. So, you know, nice, solid, tight, straight streams, go after that bulk of fire low, and then move up and out. Always go after that seat of the fire first that's feeding the rest of the, the building. So this is going to wrap up Section 5A, which is focused on concentrated water tactics with the first arriving engine. And in 5B, we're going to move on to the second and later arriving apparatus. I hope you tune in, and I hope you found the, the first section here to be useful and helpful. Take care.